The day my world turned upside down began like any other. I was in the kitchen, the aroma of freshly brewed coffee filling the air when my phone rang. Glancing at the screen, I saw Dr. Jennings' name flash. My heart sank. Elaine Morrison, I answered, trying to keep my voice steady. Mrs. Morrison, it's about your father, George. I'm sorry to say it's cancer, terminal. He might have six months, perhaps less. Dr. Jennings' voice was a blend of professionalism and sympathy. The news hit me like a physical blow. My father, the man who raised me single-handedly after Mom passed, was now facing his final chapter. Alone, the thought was unbearable. I found Ethan in his study, surrounded by piles of paperwork. Ethan, we need to talk. It's about Dad. He's... he's dying. Ethan looked up, his expression barely changing. And what do you expect me to do about it? The coldness in his voice stung, but I pushed on. I want him to move in with us. He shouldn't be alone now, and we have plenty of space. Ethan scoffed, a sound that echoed off the walls of the study. Here, live with us. Elaine, be reasonable. This house is for us, not for charity cases. If you're so desperate, let him stay in the garden shed. But that's as far as I go. The garden shed. The words echoed in my mind a cruel and mocking suggestion. How had my life come to this? Marrying Ethan, I had hoped for love and companionship, but all I found was a life of silent transactions and cold indifference. That night, as I lay in our bed, Ethan's snoring filling the room, I couldn't help but think back to the days of my youth, days filled with laughter and dreams, days when the future seemed bright and full of possibilities. And now, here I was, contemplating setting up a home for my dying father in a garden shed, because my husband, the man who vowed to stand by me, had no room for compassion in his heart. The irony of it all was not lost on me. Ethan, who always preached about family values, was now turning his back on the most basic human decency. The realization was bitter, and it kept me awake long into the night. As dawn broke, a determination stirred within me. If Ethan wouldn't help, I would do it myself. I would make the garden shed a home for my father, a place where he could spend his final days surrounded by love and care even if it was just for me. I rose from the bed my mind made up. It was time to take a stand, for my father, and perhaps for myself too. As I embarked on the task of transforming the garden shed into a livable space for my father, memories of the past swirled through my mind, each one a sharp contrast to my current life. I remembered the days of my youth in our small but happy home, where laughter was our constant companion. My father, George, was a beacon of strength and kindness, filling the void left by my mother's early passing. He taught me the value of hard work and the joy of simple living. But our simple life took an unexpected turn when I was 19. The Daltons, a prominent and influential family in our town, appeared at our doorstep with a proposal that felt more like a decree. My father had accumulated a debt, a secret he had kept hidden, fueled by his descent into gambling after Mom's death. The Daltons offered a solution, marry their son Ethan, and the debt would be forgiven. The choice was presented as an opportunity, but it was a demand. My dreams, my aspirations, and my budding relationship with Michael, the boy next door who held my heart, were all swept away in that moment. Ethan Dalton, the man who now lay beside me night after night, indifferent to my existence, was a stranger on our wedding day. Our marriage was a transaction, devoid of love or warmth, a sacrifice I made to save my father from ruin. Over the years, I had learned to play the role of Ethan's wife, managing our home and assisting in his business, without compensation or gratitude. My life had become a series of routines, my dreams shelved and forgotten. Yet as I worked on the shed, painting walls and selecting furniture, a sense of purpose I hadn't felt in years began to stir within me. This project, though born out of necessity, was mine. It was a tangible connection to the independent and spirited girl I once was, a girl who believed in making a difference. As I stood back to admire my handiwork, the shed no longer seemed like a symbol of Ethan's cruelty, but a testament to my resilience. It was small, but it was filled with the warmth and love that our sprawling mansion so conspicuously lacked. I realized then that this shed was not just for my father. It was a sanctuary for my own weary soul a place where I could reconnect with the parts of myself that I had lost in the years of my loveless marriage. It was in this small space, amidst the smell of fresh paint and new beginnings, that I made a silent vow. I would be there for my father, 
just as he had always been there for me, and in doing so, I would find a way back to myself, to the Elaine who dared to dream and love. The transformation of the garden shed into a cozy abode for my father was more than just a physical change. It was a reflection of my inner turmoil. As I worked, my thoughts often drifted to the strained tapestry of my marriage with Ethan. Our relationship, if it could be called that, was a study in silent endurance. Ethan was always more a businessman than a husband. He viewed everything through the lens of profit and loss, including our marriage. The warmth and connection that should have adorned a marital life were conspicuously absent in ours. We were like two parallel lines under one roof, destined never to meet. In the early years, I tried to breach the chasm between us. I attempted to take an interest in his work, to be the wife I thought he wanted, but my efforts were met with indifference, or at times with barely concealed irritation. Ethan had no interest in a partner. He wanted an accessory, someone to manage his home and host his business associates. As the years passed, I found myself fading into the background of Ethan's life. I was there, yet invisible, my existence acknowledged only when it served a purpose. The realization was a slow and painful awakening. I was living in a gilded cage, a bird with clipped wings. My father's illness and Ethan's callous reaction to it were the final straws. How could the man I had spent nearly three decades with show such disregard for basic human empathy? The realization that my life with Ethan had been devoid of genuine affection hit me with renewed force. But amidst this turmoil, there was a silver lining. My son, Daniel, was the one true joy in my life. Raising him had given me purpose, a reason to smile amidst the coldness of my marriage. Daniel, now a young man studying at university, was everything Ethan was not. Kind, compassionate, and full of life. I often wondered what Daniel thought of his father's behavior, of the palpable tension that hung in the air whenever Ethan was home. But Daniel, ever the peacemaker, never voiced his concerns. He was the bridge between two worlds that refused to converge. As I placed the final cushion on the newly installed couch in the shed, a sense of accomplishment washed over me. It was modest, but it was filled with love and care, something that my vast, luxurious home lacked. This small shed had become a symbol of my resilience, a quiet rebellion against the life of silent compliance I had been living. It was a step, however small, towards reclaiming the parts of myself that I had lost in the shadows of my marriage. And as I looked at the shed, now ready to welcome my father, I made a silent promise to myself. I would no longer be a spectator in my own life. It was time to take control, to find my voice again. For my father, for Daniel, and for the Elaine who deserved to be heard. The days following the completion of the shed were a whirlwind of emotion and activity. My father moved in, his frail frame a stark reminder of the precious little time we had left. Despite his condition, his eyes sparkled with gratitude as he settled into his new abode. The small space was filled with love and memories, a sharp contrast to the cold luxury of the main house. During this time, Ethan's true nature became increasingly apparent. His visits to my father were perfunctory, devoid of any genuine concern. His indifference was a bitter pill to swallow, but it was not unexpected. What pained me more was the growing realization that I had allowed myself to be diminished, to become a mere shadow in my own life. One evening, as I was organizing old files in Ethan's study, I stumbled upon documents that laid bare the extent of his deceit. Bank statements, emails, and letters painted a picture of a man who was not just indifferent, but morally corrupt. There were dubious business deals, secret accounts, and, most shockingly, evidence of infidelity. The discovery shook me to my core. The man I had married, the father of my child, was a stranger. His betrayal was not just breach of our marital vows, but a complete disregard for the family we had built together. In that moment, something within me shifted. The years of suppressed anger and disappointment surged to the surface, fueling a newfound resolve. I could no longer be a bystander in my own life story. I started to secretly gather evidence of Ethan's misdeeds. Each document, each piece of evidence, was a step towards my liberation. It was not just about seeking justice. It was about reclaiming my dignity, my self-worth. As the days passed, I became more determined. I began to plan my exit from this loveless marriage. My conversations with my father, once filled with shared memories and laughter, 
now often turn to discussions of the future. You've always been strong, Elaine, my father would say, his voice weak but his eyes full of love. You deserve happiness, you and Daniel. Don't let Ethan take that away from you. My father's words were a balm to my troubled soul. In his wisdom and love, I found the strength to envision a life beyond Ethan's shadow. The final push came unexpectedly. One day, as Ethan berated me over some trivial matter, something inside me snapped. His words, once capable of wounding me deeply, now fell on deaf ears. "'I'm not your property, Ethan,' I said calmly, the clarity in my voice surprising even myself. I am a person, deserving of respect and love, neither of which you've ever given me. Ethan's response was a mix of shock and anger, but I was beyond caring. I had spent too many years under his thumb, and I would no longer allow him to control my narrative. That night, as I lay in bed, a plan began to form in my mind. I would leave Ethan, but not empty-handed. I would fight for what was rightfully mine and Daniel's. It was not just about financial security— it was about setting things right, about ensuring that Ethan faced the consequences of his actions. The next few weeks were a blur of activity. I met with lawyers, gathered evidence, and prepared my case. It was a daunting task, but with each step I felt more empowered, more like the Elaine I had once been. And then, one sunny morning, as I sat in the shed with my father watching the birds flit about in the garden, I knew it was time. I was ready to face Ethan, ready to end the charade of a marriage that had been nothing but a prison. I'm going to do it, Dad, I said, my voice steady. I'm going to leave Ethan and start a new life. For me, for you, for Daniel. My father smiled. A fragile but genuine smile. I've always believed in you, Elaine. It's time for you to believe in yourself. With that, I stood up, my resolve firm. It was time to close this chapter of my life and begin anew. Elaine Morrison was no longer a victim of circumstance. She was a woman in control of her destiny. The day I confronted Ethan was a day of reckoning. Armed with my gathered evidence and bolstered by a newfound sense of self-worth, I faced him in what had once been our shared study. The room, once a symbol of our joint life, now felt like a battleground. Ethan, I began, my voice steady despite the tumultuous emotions within. This marriage, our life together, it's over. I'm leaving you. His reaction was a mix of disbelief and scorn. Leave me, Elaine. You have nothing without me. Where will you go? You think you can survive out there on your own? His words, meant to intimidate, only strengthened my resolve. I have more than you realize, Ethan. I have evidence of your infidelity, your shady business dealings, and your financial mismanagement. I'm not leaving empty-handed. The look of shock on Ethan's face was, in a way, satisfying. For years, I had been under his thumb— underestimated and undervalued. But now, the tables were turned. Over the following weeks, our life unraveled like a poorly knit sweater. The divorce proceedings were bitter, with Ethan trying to discredit me at every turn. But I stood my ground, backed by irrefutable evidence and a legal team that believed in my cause. As the truth of Ethan's actions came to light, his reputation, both personal and professional, began to crumble. The community we had once been a part of turned its back on him. His business associates distanced themselves, and even his closest friends began to see him for who he truly was. In a twist of fate, it was Ethan who ended up isolated and alone, much like he had made me feel all these years. The empire he had built on lies and deceit was now his prison, a constant reminder of his moral bankruptcy. The final divorce settlement was more than just a financial victory for me— it was a symbol of my liberation. I received a significant portion of our assets, enough to ensure a comfortable life for myself, my father, and Daniel. With the legal battles behind me, I focused on rebuilding my life. I bought a modest but beautiful home, not far from the university where Daniel was studying. It was a fresh start, a place where my father could spend his remaining days surrounded by love and care. The house quickly became a home, filled with laughter and warmth a stark contrast to the cold, uh, impersonal mansion I had left behind. My father's health, while still fragile, seemed to improve in this new environment, buoyed by the positive energy that surrounded him. As for myself, I found a sense of peace I hadn't known in years. I took up gardening, something I had always wanted to do, but never had the time for. I also began volunteering at a local charity, finding fulfillment in helping others. The most significant change, however, was within me. 
I no longer saw myself through Ethan's eyes. I was no longer the timid, compliant wife, but a strong, independent woman who had faced adversity and emerged victorious. One evening, as I sat on the porch watching the sunset, a sense of contentment washed over me. I had come a long way from the scared young girl who had entered a loveless marriage to save her father. I had fought for my dignity, for my right to happiness, and I had won. My journey was not just about leaving Ethan, it was about finding myself, and as I looked towards the future, I knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, I would face them with strength and grace. Elaine Morrison had finally come home. 